non-profit member, press council of India member, New Delhi Municipal Council member, and the list goes on. She participates in various television shows on matters of national and international importance. She has represented media in the board to get the ban on media coverage of case proceedings and the Nirbhaya rape case revoked and was successful in her effort. Let's give it to her. Without taking more time, I now invite our guest speaker for the day, Sri Manakshi Lekeji, to address our audience. Respected Sumaji, uh, Heeraji, uh, past chairpersons, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have been asked to speak about experiences and reflections. So I think I still cannot uh, reflect too much about my life because I feel I have uh, a lot to work for and many more years to work for. So no reflections today. Experiences uh, are a petty and which I am willing to share, provided I feel I must take some questions from the audience and weave my address around those questions that you get to know where I come from. Uh, so anybody who has some question about, uh, about anything, then I weave my experience around those things. No? No questions? So, no, please, no, something, you know, like, for me to speak without the subject gets a bit tough. Then I go on blabbering. I don't want to blabber. I want some, some insight. I mean, I mean fantastic question. Fantastic question. Fantastic question, ma'am. So, I begin with this question. And anybody else who has... Any related to question or around this question, I make my story. Madam, how will you genuinely empower the woman in the political field and the national administrative field? Still, in spite of all the professions, the union cabinet is, doesn't have enough woman representation. How do we empower the woman in the National level. Anybody else? Uh, but yes, I can hear you. After achieving so much, how do you still remain so humble and humane? Ah, that. <laughs> ma'am. Yes, please. Sona, here. Meet ma'am. Sona here. Ah. <laughs> do we see you as the chief minister? Administration 
and magistrate meant black court. And for me, magistrate was somebody who was a judge and you have to study law to get there. So those were the ideas of judiciary, judges and the system that you kind of fasc get fascinated with and a uh, lot of injustices which you see around and you think law is a big empowering tool to straighten up many creases in the social setup. So I studied law for that reason. But I was a very uh, rebellious child. I mean, for a long time, I wasn't rebellious. I was somebody who took what parents had to offer. That's okay. If, you, if it's there, I'll take it. And uh, so if I share the stories, you'll, you'll find them funny. But maybe that's for another time. But uh, that's how law came into my head. Later in life, I grew up that DM meant an IS officer and not a magistrate. <laughs> but by then, I was hung up on being a lawyer. So good students must study science was the time I grew up in. And uh, when I was growing up, Delhi being that special status UT, we didn't have uh, state colleges. So everybody could apply and nobody needed a domicile in Delhi. You, everyone across the country would apply to get admitted. And uh, uh, so medicine is one profession which every parent wanted their child to get into. So I also studied because I was a very obedient kid at that time and uh, took exams. Uh, but gradually my experiences uh, changed me and uh, uh, when I passed in class 12, it so happened that in DPMT I got across in other colleges which were out of Delhi perhaps you might as well get into Delhi PMT. I'm not sending my daughter outside and not filling up any bond or anything. I'm not using the words but I've quoted some other time but dad said itne paise me tu ladki ki shadi ho jati hai. DPMT is what you will make it. If you can make it good, if you can't, your choice. So I got 761 marks and the cutoff was 764. And four lists had come and one question carried four marks and there was negative marking also. That means one more question right there would be <coughs> that to do anything which no other child or person could get him to do. But he was also overtly protective about me at that age and those overprotectiveness got me where I, where I was and entered into a conflict zone with him. Because of his affection, I was in conflict with that because I wanted my freedom, I wanted to do things and he wanted me closed, etc. Worried about daughter, worried about a rebellious daughter all the more. And, uh, that incident changed me to the extent that after my graduation, I came from a business family. Oh, you've done your graduation, get married, types. And I was like, no way. My mother stood by me and she said, all oh, she wants us to study, let her study. And he said, Acha thikye, you can study, but you can become a teacher, you can become a professor, <laughs> you, could, you could enter masters, but no way are you going to do law. No lawyer. And I was like, Karma to lawyer here. <laughs> and that was the conflict zone because he said, uh, lawyer daughter at that time, that's like almost uh, 30 plus years ago, was a no no because uh, they all felt uh, uh, with this kind of uh, uh, spirit, who's going to marry her and where will she end up, etc., etc. But uh, lo and behold, uh, I studied law and I learned to blackmail him also. <laughs> when he was very forceful, I told my dad, I said, look, I have found a place which is a working women hostel. 
if you don't allow me to study, I will move into the hostel. I'll start working and I'll fund my own education and I'll leave the house. And I genuinely had worked on this plan. I studied this, I had <coughs> actually found a place called <coughs> All India Women Conference. They run Working Women Hostel. And he was like, look, you know, my, my daughter is studying law and she's not getting married. I said, Abhi main ghar dungi to kya what will happen then? So he succumbed to my blackmail. And then he stopped interfering in whatever decisions I took in life. Uh, I'm sharing the story because I usually don't share this part of me, but I'm kind of, I feel everybody should know that side, that how uh, a normally obedient child becomes a rebel. Uh, and that rebellion was for a cause because my mother was seeing something in me which my dad was not identified. And within three to five months of my becoming a lawyer. Uh, as luck will have it, I did a very important matter in the court. It was a bail application of a very famous, famous, not famous, famous, but infamous builder, Skipper. Anybody who's from Delhi or has some background in Delhi would know Skipper Towers case had happened. He had uh, ruined several people's lives. But his bail application was listed in the court on a day when court was on the on uh, when there was a strike in the court, it was in the high court, and I was assigned as a youngster a duty to sort of assist the court. And while assisting the court, uh, the court would have rejected the bail application, so everybody had to depend on me because it, the, it was from my office also. I was assigned that task. I ended up arguing that case within six months of my entering the profession. Now that became such a hit that a young woman comes into the profession, argues the case, gets such a crook a bail, <laughs> which many seniors would be able to. <laughs> so in Delhi circuit, this became such a news that here is a young child, young kid, young lawyer on the block who simply entered the profession, smashed the court and made a big name and that got published all over in the papers, etc. And my father happened to read that. You can't imagine the emotion that my dad would have gone through and he kept that paper with him till the end. So sharing the story is important. That is not as if parents uh, don't recognize the child's capacity, but sometimes they are overprotective and that overprotection uh, impedes the child's growth and I'm saying this because several of us today are uh, young women, ladies who have young kids who want to touch the sky, who have their dreams, but we end up impeding that growth because we want them to tread a secure path. We don't allow them the freedom which they seek and freedom to achieve, freedom to be who they are. I think that's what needs to be given. And if that freedom is given, a whole lot of people, God knows what they become in life. And, but many a times experiences changes a person also. Uh, and those experiences, uh, if you have the metal in you, you bring the best on the table. And that's what is also essential part of learning curve. Like at least I learned from all the mistakes I made. I learned from all the difficulties I went through. Uh, and all those experiences helped me to be who I am and connect the way I connect is because I've gone through some of those processes in my growing up years. So far so good. I met my husband who's a great guy. <coughs> person who probably in my assessment I was looking for. I married him, went back to my dad, joked with him that would you have found a guy like him? <laughs> married, had kids. Uh, uh, I was originally a criminal lawyer and a taxation lawyer. I did 
indirect taxes, uh, excise customs and all. Uh, long time when kids came my way, uh, little slow down, but was there in the profession. And uh, started writing on women issues. And here also I joke that any, any woman who has a thinking head is a feminist. Or any woman who has a head over her shoulder is a feminist. Every woman is a feminist. I think somewhere all of us uh, yearn to do uh, things in life. And there is a misconception that uh, is uh, filtered through uh, communications. Uh, uh, many people communicate those things to us that women are the ones who, uh, who come in the way of progress of another woman and women and animosity, etc. But I feel that's a falsity, that's a wrong notion. Because uh, in life, this kind of, I won't use the word patriarchy, but this kind of thinking is a wrong thinking. Because most of the time, I've had uh, friends from both genders, men and women, who have helped me to be who I am. When kids were growing up, I had so many women friends who would take care of the kids, pick them up, drop them help me uh, find food with this girl. And that time my resources also were limited as compared to today. Um, she had, she was the only earning member in her family. Her parents were not working. She was a 19 year old child. I call her child because my kids are much older than that today. Uh, so no doctor wanted to treat her eye and nobody wanted to take an onus. The hospital was not taking responsibilities, doctors were not taking responsibilities. She was not a worker of the hospital, she had been hired from outside. She was not a full nurse, she was an auxiliary nurse, so on and so forth. So that battle taught me a great deal, you know, that it brought out the toughest in me, it brought out the best in me also. Uh, so when I was uh, with her, eight years of this bad experience, every pain that, uh, you know, it's like every pain that your client goes through, you go through with it. And you know, for her to commute because there was constant infection in her ear, uh, in her eye. So constantly dealing with the doctors, giving some financial help, paying for the auto rickshaw, giving some supplies back home. She went through a lot, a lot. And those experiences had such an impact uh, on anybody who was so close in proximity. And when contesting that case for eight years from trying to go to the Supreme Court, we were in that case, fought against the hospital, fought against Delhi administration, fought against the cops, fought against the doctors. Um, so many multiplicity of litigation and uh, 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 how administration should have dealt with it, etc., etc. A new law was created, but that was about the vicarious liability of the institution where such a thing has happened. I mean, like, if something goes wrong in the hotel and the hotel said the two are private parties, I have nothing to do with it, that is not the law today. At that time, there was no law dealing with those situations. So, we, this case helped in changing that legal uh, jurisprudence. Um, and then when I would argue this case, I would say death penalty for the accused because that's what that girl wanted, death penalty for the accused. But every time I argued that, the court would say, where is the law, Miss? Where, from where do you get this? And I'll have a long drawn argument that this was a case of 302, this was a murder case, she survived, it's so treated as attempt to murder, and attempt to murder will attract the same penalty as murder itself, give, her death, give the death penalty to the accused because that's what the girl constantly said, <coughs> that I want death for this man. Kept arguing and finally it settled for life imprisonment and no death. And, uh, uh, but this gave me a lot of insight into the victim's story and victim's side into the wrong happenings in the system. Uh, compensation, law of compensation did not exist, so we got that compensation thing done. We got uh,
many, I mean, on the side I was fighting several other battles. Subsequently, when Nirbhaya happened in Delhi, all that experience came forth and helped me work on that. So two people who are no more in the country, I would like to remember both of them. Uh, Sushma ji was heading uh, uh, the party. She was leader of the opposition in the parliament in the Lok Sabha. And uh, Mr. Jaitley was the leader of uh, opposition in Rajya Sabha. Mr. Gadkari was the party president at that point in time. <coughs> By now, I had joined politics. Um, I mean, a few years ago, but I had joined politics. So Mr. Gadkari and all these three people decided that uh, parties must make representation. BJP has to send a representation on amendment of the laws to the Burma committee. Let Minarchi Lekki draft that. So, on behalf of the party, I got the opportunity to draft. And, and they all in synchrony, in harmony said, she's the best person to deal with it. She should, she should draft the laws. So, I drafted certain things. And uh, it went through the process. It went to Burma committee <laughs> under the signature of Mr. Gadkari. And uh, whatever we said, 70% of that got accepted at that point in time, in 2012, around that time, 2010 or so. So that got accepted between 10 and 12. This is the incidence. Uh, whatever 30% was left, we accomplished that now, 2015, 16. <laughs> Uh, so, this is how life's experiences train you, teach you, and you never even know what is going to hit you where and how you're going to bring in that change within the setup, within the social system. And I feel uh, many a times in life, we all, I'm sure everyone in the audience, we, everyone shares the same experience, that we all have ups and downs in career progression that you were, you were supposed to do a project when you are taking care of the kids, you don't get promotion and continue to do the same job which you've done for years. So to deal with all these things as a, as a thinking person, I think what helps is that your inner strength of character Leadership is not a leadership just being in politics, but leadership is leadership no matter what you do. So watching over your child who is going for a swimming class or a tennis class or a soccer match, uh, taking care of the elderly at home, taking care of the staff, everything is about leadership. So it's not as if one has wasted any time. It's about how you use your time is what matters. And leadership is not just political leadership. It is entrepreneurial, it's social. I interact with such beautiful people. And again, I want to mention one lady. Uh, there are two women actually in my area, they're from my community. Uh, Shami Talwar and uh, Dr. Ruby Makhija. So these are new found uh, well beings. Uh, so one is a uh, doctor, she's a eye surgeon, and the other uh, was a housewife for a long time. But both of them had now started this environment group in the community. And they put me on board, and they're working with all the other ways in my area. Uh, they, of course, seek patronage, they use my name wherever the administrative authorities need to be dealt with. But these are the women who have brought the change on the ground. All the other viewers, they've got them to say no to plastic, no to plastic bags. Everyone must come out and vote during elections. So this particular, uh, this Dr. Ruby, in their community, in their colony, 82% people voted. And they sent young kids to campaign that please go out and vote, go out and vote. It's a different matter. I got all the 82% votes from that colony. <laughs> But uh, the fact that they ran the campaign that everyone must step out and exercise their right to vote was big. And exercise that no plastic means no plastic. They have actually, they've started a composting pit 
they uh, told uh, and Dr. Sh uh, Shami Talwar was doing uh, composting and cleanliness in the colony, defense colony for a very, very long time. I mean, it must have been 10 years, 20 years ago. And uh, these are the ladies who are making change on the ground and, and impacting everyone around. So, and I'd love to look at their leadership. We work in coherence with each other. Then there's another group I work with, uh, Deepak. Uh, he, uh, when PM started Fit India movement, they said, ma'am, under you we're going to start Fit India campaign. I said, let's work on it. He said, okay. Everyone, they put every resource together, putting all the entire campaign, having games, sponsorships, everything together. And community mobilization on subjects and things. I think that's what leadership is all about. After all, I entered politics to bring that change. I seriously... Uh, on a joke, of course, I said that I came into politics as a midlife crisis, which is also true because I didn't know what to do with my life. And uh, I said, you know, all the talks that I've had and all the writings I used to give to this person, that person, bring this change, make this law, etc. I felt it was it was not being used properly. It, and like I told you that I went and met Advani Ji uh, long, long back. I talked about gender. Budgeting in the year 2098, at that time when uh, when um, Sumitra Thai was uh, WCD minister and Yashwant Sinaji was the uh, finance minister, and he looked through me. I mean, sorry to say this today, but he virtually was like, "What is this teeny thing talking gender <laughs> and talking of uh, um, you know gender budgeting and all?" Um, but today I'm so happy that government is genuinely making that change. It's not about gender budgeting which the government is bringing, but it's budget which is around women. You know, health, uh, ex expenditure on housing, because all the houses in the Pradhan Mandri Awas are going to women, not to men in the house. Uh, uh, Ujwala, all women, uh, inoculations, vaccination, leaves, uh, uh, Matra uh, Bandana, Matra scheme, so on and so forth. So women-centric approach is how times have changed in 15, 20 years. And I would say all this that back then that people would just not, you know, know what is one talking about. So I'm so happy that uh, in front of my eyes, uh, all the things I dreamt of or wanted to work for are happening. You know, 370, 35A, 35A was completely a gender biased law. And I remember having a conversation with one of the former Chief Justices. He was that time a judge. I had, of course, entered politics. And we were having a sideline conversation in one of the conventions or something. And I said, Sir, I want to fight this case. So he said, You don't fight. I said, No, I want to fight this case. I want, how can you? How can this happen? So they say, yeah, this is wrong, but you don't find a case. Get someone else to do it. <laughs> I said, no, but I, I feel I am so passionate about it. I want to do away with this. So they say, yeah, but you have a tab of uh, BJP. So uh, even if you talk sense, it will be labeled as BJP agenda. And now look, BJP has completed its agenda for <laughs> the case. So I'm very happy that I thought and lived my life throughout that 370 is the most rotten thing that can happen to a state of India. It is gone. 35A, how many of you know about 35A? 370, I'm sure all of you know. Yeah, there's two, three people. Okay. Uh, so from the dais, uh, if I may say something, uh, 35A was under the garb of permanent resident certificate, uh, how that was being played out. That uh, the example of Farooq Abdullah is what I usually give. So I give that example. So certain people who were there in 1947, they get the certificate of permanent residency. People who came post 1947 a certain date do not get permanent residency. So a lot of people came from the then POK. I mean, because when Pakistan took over a certain part, 
lot of people from there migrated to this part of Jammu and Kashmir. Then around 49 or so, or before also, a lot of people from Balmiki community also came into the state. So some weird law which existed in 1938 or 28, we should have finished because when the states came, dominion status goes, so all the old laws go with it. But somehow, surreptitiously, 1954-35A through presidential order, as a setup between Sheikh Abdullah and Nehru, was brought into the appendix to the constitution. Because any constitutional amendment would happen with a certain number and can only be brought in. But they used presidential order to surreptitiously insert this particular old law of 1938 or 28. And according to that law, that uh, Certificates are granted on a certain date. Anybody who came into the state after that was not granted that certificate. So in Farooq Abdullah's case, he married a Scottish woman. Uh, so Scottish woman, with foreign origin, like she's not even an Indian, she got the PRC status under the state. Because a man marrying anybody gets PRC status. Now their son, Omar Abdullah, also married a Punjabi girl. She also gets the PRC status because Omar gets it and she gets it. The daughter of Farooq Abdullah marries another guy from another state. She loses her PRC status and her husband definitely doesn't get one. And the children also don't get the status. So the children of Omar Abdullah could contest elections, could hold government positions or get into the service. Whereas children of the daughter would not be granted that status and would never be in politics in that state. So a, da a daughter of the state marrying anybody outside loses her residency status. That was the rule. A boy has a right to marry whoever. The spouse and the <coughs> children will get the status. Whereas the other way around it will not happen. So I wanted to challenge that in the court and I, and I definitely wanted to challenge Ritul Talak. I definitely was one for uniform civil court and things. So these were the things I grew up with. And I grew up with like 84, 85, 85, yeah it was 85. 84 was the time when riots happened and I had entered uh, college that year. Uh, as I discussed the protect, protective background I came from. That day was such a terrible day for parents back home because this was a time without cell phones. Six hours I kept standing at the bus stop to catch a bus, wouldn't, get, wouldn't get a bus and so many people I knew were, uh, were some of the sick guys got their turban shaped and all that. It all happened in front of my eyes and we had a professor uh, Professor Kheda, he never taught me directly, but he was in charge of NSS and things. So he, after the riots happened, he used to tell us to bring newspapers as Radhi back to college. So every student will carry some Radhi back to college. And that Radhi will be stacks, a room full of uh, newspapers which will be sold. And the money generated out of that, the bicycles will be bought and uh, some sewing machines will be bought, who will be given to the victims. So that was my first political training. That how a government could be party to writing and how citizens could lose their lives. That happened in 84. And that had its own impact on my psyche. 85, we were all, like I was kind of getting initiated in women's struggle and this and that. At that point in time, Shah Banu happened. Arif Mohammed Khan had just resigned from the government as a MOS home. So he was my hero at that age. You know, you look up to him and you say, that's the kind of guy who can leave power for his principles and for the right thing. And Shah Banu, then we studied up, grew up in that atmosphere that how then government tried to subvert the rights of women by bringing a law, rights of protection of women, Muslim women on Divorce Act, which was basically to say that uh, whatever uh, a you get, that is that is it, you can't get uh, 
125, you can't get maintenance under 125 of the CRPC, which got changed subsequently, I think, in 1999-2000. Abdul Latif filed that case. I used to come to my dad, Dan and Law, who's a senior advocate, and we saw interactions over that. I saw offers when I entered court in 1990. I ran through those. I saw Anand Maghi's case, which happened, and my own family people were the lawyers, etc. So all those things have a deeper, deeper impact on your, uh, on your psyche, on your uh, struggles. On we came from the time when uh, Congress could do no wrong. We, we, I grew up at, in that time, and I saw how many wrongs were covered up, or the sins were covered up. I think everything added up. To, to make you who you are and to see through those struggles and uh, of course emergency, those kind of stories and the kind of things I have heard and read and my own family went through, my in-laws family went through. Even the gas cylinders had been taken away by the cops. The mattresses from home had been taken away by the cops. Young kids, 9 year old, 10 year old, didn't know where to go, what to say, what to sleep on. But struggles make you tough keep you focused and help you search who you really are and that's the message that search for who you are, what you stand for gets to be tested and the saying is when the, when the going gets tough then the tough gets going so the tough do get going finally. Jai Hind, thank you very much. <laughs>